Today, I want to talk about the beautiful and innovative mind. Basically, it's a story about a research we did for the last four years where we try to find out how are we actually create these wonderful ideas. We know a lot about ideas, but we don't know where they come from all of a sudden, or is there a pattern? So imagine you could innovate at any given point of time. How cool would that be? And there is all about creativity, about innovation. And so I want to give you a test. What about you are now trying to create something wonderful and creative from a platypus and lexicrypt? So we have platypus, lexicrypt. Think about it. something very creative. Doesn't matter what it is, just be creative. So you will realize this is actually very difficult. And when I was asked how did I create my four companies that I built before, and they were all disruptive and they were all innovative. So people ask, ask so how do you think? How is it going on in your mind that you come up four times with these companies and you even held startups? And I honestly didn't really know. And one point, one, at one point somebody said, tell me step by step about your innovative mind. And I realized, okay, I really don't know. So I went back in time and looked what I actually did at Computer 2000, my very first company. So we decided to go uh, develop a business model that is only going indirect, meaning we dealt only with authorized business partners and didn't do any deals on the side. What typically every distrib distributor does, and at the end of the day, everybody said, this is impossible, actually you can't do that. You know, distribution is a 5,000 year old business is interwoven around the world, you can't just change that. But I was 26 and I thought, eh, I give it a try, because I had this idea how I could do that. Now, years later, the company grew to 10 billion in revenue and we were bypassing basically 8,000 of multi-million dollar competitor and became the third largest in the world with our startup. When I exited, I went to Silicon Valley and started another company, Blue Roads. And Blue Roads was a software company and back in the days, you know, early internet days, we started with a software as a service concept, which was, again, totally disruptive and innovative. There were only one company who does this besides us, and that was Salesforce.com. People said, you know, if you want to go to enterprises with that kind of software, this will never work. I mean, forget it. And we actually did not get funding because of that. Plus, there were two established giants. And so our idea was different, and it was radical in a way. But five years later, we became market leader. So the question is, how was that possible? And I did two other companies in a similar manner. And again, how can somebody build a company with 15 or 20 or $50,000 and make a billion dollar company out of it? And we know there are many, many, many. But still the reason to do that was clear, but how was completely unclear. So in our quest, we said, we thought, you know, we look for other things that are, or other situations that are similar, but possibly entirely different. And we came up with this idea of looking at athletes. You know, they do things today which are kind of amazing. And I'm old enough to realize that for 50 years ago, <laughs> this was simply impossible. So we saw, we looked at people climbing up in California, a mountain called Half Dome in Yosemite National Park. And they took about seven to 10 days to climb up. Seven to 10 days, but now, what, look what, what's going on today. Two hours and 20 minutes. I mean, an unbelievable transformation. And we were saying, well, how is this possible? And we look into something else. Skiers in the 50s. You know, fears going down the slope. And today, in 2000, you know, perfectly balanced. And I mean, an amazing style and absolutely cool looking. And we looked at something else, at the motorbike artists. 
you know, he's kind of juggling his motorbike, very nice. But 50 years later, people do something very different. So for us, it was the big question. What was the amazing transformation that made that possible? Is it biological evolution? Probably not, not in 50 years. But we realized that athletes over time, particularly in the last 50 years, begin to completely understand their body. They try to exactly uh, live with their body, not just you know, mentally, but even understand the physics. Uh, my son told me, you know, we can train a single muscle. And I thought, man, I mean, a single muscle. <laughs> and so with that, we were very clear we need to rethink innovation completely. Because we need to start, like the athletes, with our most precious good, and in our case, it's the brain. We need to know how the brain works. You know, the brain is actually the source of all the creativity, so to speak, but we don't even know how. And we realized also in the sports people, and we interviewed a couple of these superstars, and a friend of mine actually is an Olympic gold winner uh, in swimming, and so he told me about the terrain, which every sports guy actually has to live by. They know their terrain deeper and more intense than pretty much anybody else, even the local people, you know, and skiing and so forth. And our terrain as a business person is the market. We need to know the needs and the dreams of our customers. And if we don't, how would we be able to innovate something for them if we don't even know what they're dreaming about? And last but not least, we realized training and equipment. So if you remember that skier um, back in the 50s and today, you know, the equipment is very different. But I had a chance actually to talk to somebody and he said, you know, even if you would have given me this, the best equipment today available, I would not be even able to be close to where these guys are because they manage their body in a very different way like we did. And so for me, it was very clear we need to understand how we deal with our machine up there, the brain. So let's start with the brain. So the brain brings us a shocking realization. And that was actually by Dr. David Eagleman, a neuroscientist from Stanford University who postulated, you know, we're actually not creative. Humans, homo sapiens, cannot create anything. So what we're doing in our brain, and you see this on this picture actually pretty nicely, is we associate ideas, basically, or impressions from various sources. And even though the brain might look like a shocking machine that we never understand, uh, we probably don't. It's very similar to a chip. You know, when you look into chips, uh, you know, little silicon, 6.9 billion transistors on this one. We don't need to understand this. But what we do understand very well is the machine that uses it, this one. You know, we know our mobile phones, our smartphones. We know how to call, we know how to send messages, we know how to get our calendar, uh, we know how to get our next events, and how to do almost anything that we do with regular computers. Nobody knows how it's done inside, and we don't even care. You know, cars are so complex these days that we don't know how this engine works, this almost fully electronic machine, uh, and we don't need to. We have our dashboard, and we run, and we run pretty fast, but also we can brake pretty fast, and that's all we need to know. The same with our brain. We need to understand the behavior and not the little details that, that, that go up there. So in the end of the day, um, the, the, the discovery brings two major, really major new things. And this is probably more interesting for you than anything else. If we are not creative, we can actually turn it upside down. If everything is composed by ideas that we already had, we can say whatever we can imagine, we can actually make because all the parts already existed. If we take blue and if we take yellow and we mix it together, we know it's green. But we can take any experience and any other experience and maybe 50 experiences and mix it together and something new pops up. But every of these new ideas 
are based on the experiences we had. So if this is the way how the brain works, then we also know everybody can actually create amazing ideas because we all have millions and millions of experiences. So at the end of the day, when we put this all together, we can say we are made of things. We know that, right? But so are our ideas. They're not magic. They actually come together from very concrete situations. We only mix it together. So if we now learn that the brain is putting ideas together based on experiences, and experiences are a key driver, we can also begin to understand why some executives, for instance, don't really know where to start because they have a different experience than the market. And if they don't know the market, then they're pretty much off. So in this, uh, the, the dashboard, I mean, that was a true innovation because we look through and have a dashboard in front of us. Another car manufacturer built a huge display in the car, which was not so innovative. But because he had a little bit more marketing power, now the rest of the world looks into this not so practical <laughs> device. And it was basically their experience. And since the market was not understood by most of the bigger car manufacturers, and they put this only in exclusive cars, they couldn't really get the innovation to market. So we put together the five big I mean, aspects of innovation, the five powers. And it started with, guess what, with experimentation and experiences. So we all have experiences, and that means we all can innovate. And that is a profound basis for new innovation. We're not looking into, OK, let's buy some startup, or let's, let's create some environment and all kind of dream and so on. Why do you dream? What for? If you don't know for whom, <laughs> it's a total waste of time. But we did not know before. So the second aspect is for our executives. You know, they, they will love it. No more experimentation. We can do strategic innovation. Wonderful. They can now shift their entire innovation focus completely into a new direction because it's not waiting for some random idea because now it is actually a strategic development in a certain direction for the customers and make them ridiculously exciting because they now hopefully know how it works. The third step obviously then is the way to create those ideas. And we realized a couple things. So you saw this brain piece earlier with the connections in between. The brain has a cool function. It actually prevents us from get going too crazy. It helped us for the last five million years to stay in our realm. And if there's a tiger, you know, freeze. You know, in that moment, it saved more lives than any information and any inno innovation back in the days for millions of years. But we're not attacked by tigers anymore and not by geog uh, geo uh, geographies and by other people and so on. So we can actually go crazy. And the next step for going crazy is then understanding, and this is what we are innovating for, the market. What do we actually want to do in this market? So innovation to market, meaning get the product, the idea into the market, is a huge effort. And most people completely under, underestimate because you know it's like a startup. You have to be there very, very quickly. Now, and what did our athletes say at the third element? They said we need training and the best possible equipment. And so one of the biggest challenge for us was to get all the bits and pieces of information in these innovation sessions that go far beyond classical brainstorming together. And if we have 20, 30 people, and maybe even 20, 30, 50 people from customers who contribute their ideas and actually validate them, then we end up with about 2,000 to 5,000 bits and pieces of innovative information. And that was obviously a shocking realization for us because we did have no tools at all. So we invented basically a digital canvas system, multi-user, multi-discipline, because it's not only engineers, but also marketing and sales and so forth, and mix it up and put some AI system behind to realize what comes from what, build relations, but also build priorities. And so at the end of the day, we have 
an information set that we can use for our innovation. We call it innovation management system. So with that said, at the end of the day, we can actually empower our team to be far more innovative. We can get them all the way to the top because we now know how our machine brain works. We know that we are actually born creative and we can simply unleash the power even for those people who don't think that they are creative, just don't know that. They get very quickly, and this is something else what our brain is actually marvelous good about, they actually can loosen up within a couple of weeks training to become actually creative. And we know this from many people who do painting classes and come back and say, I can't believe it. I can't believe that I can do that. Well, the same is actually with innovation. You will be able to do that. Thank you very much.